Jay Martin. Yeah. What are your opinions on mint Oreos? On mint Oreos, yeah. What are your opinions on pumpkin spice Oreos? So I want to make it clear. I had an intro scripted out, and my wife said, "Never mind. We're doing show, something show different." Him off. Show him off. Oh, oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Let me finish what I was saying. I had an intro scripted, and my wife said, "No, we're doing my thing," and I don't know. I don't know what's happening. I have no idea. This is this is. This is Dutch. Um, this is, this is got a little pumpkin on. It's got a little pumpkin on top. And um, this is actually really hard to find, believe it or not. Pumpkin spice Oreos. Because this is a food cha You clicked on this video for Critical Role? Stupid. Food React channel. Obviously. Mmm, so good and tasty. Did I get the negative five on sexy? Well, we're gonna try to be sexy. Do you want me to try to be sexy? I <laughs> cookie in my mouth now. Ooh. I just rinsed my mouth out with vodka. When I begin my life, pray. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably gonna stay in the video too. Let's be real. People only click on these videos to hear you give me <laughs> anyway, so. When I begin my live play breakdowns, one of the first things that needs to be understood is the context that may be missing from a moment. It's easy to remember the big, bombastic, and quotable moments from any of the campaigns that we've watched and loved or played in. But all too often, it's way too easy to forget the actual moment and the things that led to that moment. And today, we're discussing a moment that I think has the most context necessary for one of the largest gambles that has ever existed. And yes, that includes Jester's Cupcake. However, before we get into that, I have some very heavy and devastating news that I need to address. As we all know, there's something that I haven't taken accountability for, and I guess, I guess it's just time to take accountability for that. I know that we like to have fun here and goof off, but it's no excuse to make any excuses for the way that I've acted in the past several weeks. And for those of you who aren't quite sure what I'm talking about, I'm sorry for not making my spoiler warnings obvious enough. And I swear, if anyone, and I mean anyone, tries to say I didn't put a spoiler warning in, I am gonna do something so heinous, Wizards of the Other Coast will ban me from talking about their game just because of the association! Caleb Widogast was always a fascinating character to me. I've made no secret of Liam's tendency to rub me the wrong way with the characters he plays, not through any fault of his own, but simply because of my own personal preference. I tend to dislike the overly brooding characters who take themselves too seriously, and that is Liam's bread and butter. That being said, Caleb had some of the absolute best moments in the campaign, and there was one event in particular where he not only shone bright, he changed the course of the story forever. This is the story of an orphan, alone and scared and beaten, who finally chose to seize control. This is the story of Caleb Widogas and how he seized his own future. I am of the Empire, but I am no friend to the Empire. The start of this story, however, doesn't start with Caleb. Instead, much like the story of Jester and the Cupcake, it starts with the little goblin girl, Not. See, Not has been on a quest to save her husband and reunite with her family for some time. And while the story would be something that stretched over the most of the campaign, today we focus on one of the earlier portions actually finding her husband and bringing him home. See, after much investigation, the Mighty Nine has found that Knott's husband, who is a talented chemist, was taken to another nation currently at war with the Empire because of the fact that he experimented with a powerful artifact of theirs, the Luxon Beacon. As such, they have traveled to this dynasty under the guise of being a part of the community in order to retrieve him. With some careful negotiations and choice deception, they managed to get a job to investigate some strange going-ons within the dynasty. And if they could properly solve the issue, they might gain favor with an audience and with the Bright Queen. It's what you have done before the Bright Queen, and then oh. the favor will be granted by what she sees fit. Oh, who, who's the Bright Queen? Is that the whole the leader of... That's Where are you from? So, so... A roving band of goblins? But a fine investigator who seems to be diving into aiding the Empire. Yeah, only a few years ago, not separated from her band and decided to, you know, become more of a, a productive member of society. And some things haven't been filled in yet. It's she didn't get a proper <laughs> A powerful matriarch who would potentially be capable of granting the freedom of Knott's husband, Yeza. And thus, the adventure 
begins. To be honest, I'm honestly just going to skip over most of the preamble as it does not mean much to the moment we're deep diving today. The main factor that we want to take into account is that through investigation and following clues, the group finds themselves to the source of the goings on and it may be down a well in the center of the town. And thus, they choose to descend down the well and enter a situation that they could not know would end in tragedy. As they explore, eventually Nott and Caleb go ahead without the others, and something strange happens. No. Oh, no. Unsolicited whisper D and D Beyond guys. <laughs> They're looking for some new employees. You could work for the company that I'm about to run. Therefore, you're <laughs> applying for the job of being my minion. So he's rolling. He's, he's rolling. He's rolling. What is happening? Oh, there's, a, no. there's a second game of D and D going on back here. Are you going to be mind controlled? Ow. <laughs> What's going on? Oh, wow, wow, we so, wow. So, you don't, yeah. <laughs> what are you guys doing? Wow, wow, wow. Well, we're waiting because the wizard told us to stay put. Matt whispers something to Liam and has him make a roll, at which point Caleb begins to act very odd. Caleb, are you okay? So good. Oh, so I, good. Shouldn't we call the others? That would be a 12, by the way. Yes, I know. Okay, good. Should, should we call the others? Or? No, we're good. We're, I think oh. we're all right. I think well, this if is... Well, if you think we're okay, I guess we'll just wait yeah. here then. Yeah. Now, because of the fact that typically Sam picks up on these things, he sees that Caleb is acting weird and knows that Matt whispered into Liam's ear. Therefore, this is a chance for comedy. And so Sam decides to try and take things in a different level. He begins to confess something to Caleb. And the reason that this is important is it's going to be something that was very unfair to Caleb. Yes, Sam was basically just trying to embrace a comedic moment here, but it would end in leading to a certain situation that happens later in this story that is very unfair. But what is it that Sam was doing? Well, he had not confessed to Caleb that not had betrayed Caleb's confidence. At one point they had learned about a previous associate of Caleb named Astrid. And so Not and Jester had sent a letter to her. And this is the time that Not chooses to confess this. I have a confession to make. Mm -hmm. A while back, I I wrote a letter to someone that you know, Astrid. Rem remember her? Hello? <laughs> you told me about her, and I think maybe it was a mistake in retrospect, but I, I, I wrote her a letter. I was hoping to maybe reconnect you. Someone from your past might... I'm over here, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> now, this is interesting because while this is a very intense confession to have to do in this moment, it is played off as a joke, but it ends up being unfair to Caleb because he doesn't have the chance to process this. Why is that? Well, the reason that Matt whispered into Liam's ear is because Caleb is now under the influence of an incubus, meaning that he's been charmed. And this leads to a very interesting scenario. The rest of the group walks into the cave that they're in and immediately Caleb turns around as Matt says, light them up pretty. And he fireballs the entire group leading into the battle. Correct, but you see Caleb turn and looking towards you all with this kind of half-cocked eyebrow, his head kind of tilted to the side slightly. In the back of your head, a little voice just says, light them up pretty. I need all of you guys to roll dexterity saving throw as Caleb lifts a hand and casts fireball right on the front entrance way where you're all standing. Oh! Oh! I don't want to roll! A dex saving dex save? throw? A dexterity saving Holy throw. Holy shit. Yeah, I let it go. That's a fourth level too, so that is... Oh no. Now, that in itself seems like a very stressful situation, but I want to make it clear that Liam honestly took this really well and on the chin. In fact, there's even a moment where he just straight up says, This is rad. I'll be right back. Okay. With the battlefield. Oh! Ah! Fuck! This is fucking rad. You fucked me up, man. Oh, Well, she did this really spooky, sexy speech she did? in my ear. Ooh, ooh, suck your best bitch. <laughs> so obviously, it was a moment that Liam enjoyed, but for Caleb, this was particularly traumatizing. Those of you who know his backstory know that 
basically everything that had led up to him being the person he was today was because he was manipulated and controlled by a powerful group into harming some of the people he loved the most, his parents. In fact, not only did he harm them, he killed them with the very magic that this group had taught him. And now that magic was being used against the very people that he loved, the Mighty Nine. So this entire battle was basically set up to be an extremely traumatizing thing for Caleb. The reason I mention this is because it does play very much into where this story ends up going. The worst part is, is the way that Matt ends up describing how things are happening. See, Caleb is charmed, which means he's fighting for the Incubus and the Succubus who have become very magically entwined with him, but it doesn't explain why he's doing the things he's doing. So Matt provides an explanation. Now, for some reason right now, fuck! You're seeing things clearer. This whole ruse, this whole time has been your friends trying to get you here to kill you. Oh. And in the moment that something allies you, you look and your friends are casting magic at you. Justin tries to blind you. Oh shit, you have to defend yeah. yourself. No, I was trying to get through to you! <laughs> so Jester, that's your action and your movement. The charm has warped his sense of reality. It all makes sense to him now. His friends came here to kill him. They came here to betray him, just like he was convinced his own parents had done. And so as he casts these spells, he casts a wall of fire, he does everything he can to fight against his own friends. It's like he's reliving the same trauma again. But at least, you know, the battle ends amiably and not too much happens. Or at least that would be the best scenario. But no, this battle actually leads to one of the characters' deaths. Not in a moment of honestly just true, genuine accident for both Nut and Sam. They kill poor Talison's character for the second time in a campaign. Do this. It's an explosive arrow. <gasps> okay. Oh no. Oh no. Okay. No. okay. Oh no. So. Oh no. So. Oh no. As you, Wait, you as you see it rush past a friend, you fire. And the bolt you still have a strikes level? towards it and third level. detonates. Oh, no. You watch as portions oh. of the incubus are scattered across the ceiling, the walls, the floors. I celebrate. Dripping down. You still like, yeah! And all you see is like the body of Caduceus, which is thrown about five or six feet from the explosion, land on the ground, charred and dead. Mm -hmm. No! I run forward. Okay. And I cast Revivify. You still have a, a I have third a third level, level left because oh I have my third God. level fucking so power. Fuck okay. Yeah. All right, yeah, so combat's over. You go ahead and you, you pull out the diamond that you thankfully got, got back. back. Thank, thankfully, that, that ogre didn't win that fight. Oh. <laughs> Or anybody else. It doesn't end up being permanent. They're able to very quickly bring him back this time because now Jester is powerful enough to revive a character. But still, that's a very traumatic moment. The very fact that Caleb chose to betray them led to his friend dying. That is hard because it means control was taken from him and disaster ensued because of it. And even when Ford checks in with Caleb to see how he was, to see if everything was okay. Caleb ends up saying something that shines a lot more light onto it. I don't believe you'll be able to say that word, right? Right. No. I, I don't Definitely think you not. Will. No. I disagree. I was in complete control of my mind and faculties, and I would have known to say pussy smuggler if it was the time to say it. <laughs> 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 we're cool. okay. and why, and why, and we got, look, uh, the DM is um, dangerously holding a D20. He says that he was in control the whole time. He felt like he knew what he was doing. He felt like once again, he was choosing to betray the people who he loved and got one of them killed. Now, all of this is the episode before the moment we're talking about today. So why am I mentioning it? because it's important. This is an entire scenario where Caleb ends up just falling back on his past and once again being controlled by forces outside of his control. He is truly and deeply under something else's influence and it harms the people he cares about the most. He has lost all control and worst of all, despite the fact that Ford did check in on him, not very many people genuinely check in on him emotionally. He's kind of left to just deal with this whole scenario because of the pacing of the sessions, which makes what happens next far more important.
Now, before getting into the true meat and potatoes of this video, I do want to take a moment to address something. While I make these videos, it's very important that I pay attention to the players and I understand their actions before, in the moment, and after the moment. And while doing this, it can be really difficult to pick up on certain cues as I'm not actually a player at their table. Because of this, the most that I can do is just try and fill in the gaps and try and make disclaimers like this one, understanding that I don't fully understand what's going on, but I can try and make inferences. Recently, I've had the chance to play in an actual real play of Monster of the Week, not done the Dragons 5e, although to be honest, Monster of the Week is one of my favorite systems of all time, so if you guys haven't checked that one out, go ahead and check it out. The reason I'm mentioning it, however, is it's a much different story to play a game in front of cameras knowing that people will be watching it, and having the experience to do so with the players at my table has been honestly fantastic. We just posted one of our first episodes this past Wednesday on our YouTube channel, and it's still brand new, and we hope that it kicks off the ground, but mainly we just want to keep playing with each other because we enjoy it so much. But I cannot stress enough how much this experience has helped me make these videos. I understand a little bit more what people feel when they're playing in front of a camera, instead of just playing at their tables because it really is a lot more different than you might expect. So yeah, I kind of just wanted to give a shout out to our new live play while at the same time pointing out that I do understand that a lot of the things that I say is just inferences. I cannot truly know what's going through the players' heads. I could just do my best to try and fill in the gaps. So yeah, let's get in to the true portion of this video. So, with the investigation being a success, the group is able to finally afford favor with the Bright Queen, and they gain an audience with her. But as the journey there unfolds, we see Caleb being put in a very tough spot. See, the problem is, is that humans are not actually allowed in the dynasty that they're in. It is a place that is primarily controlled by drow and bestial-like races, so humans are not typically very well treated. As such, Bo and Caleb, the resident humans of the party, are forced to take on a different disguise. Well, yes, they could disguise themselves magically, it's not gonna last long enough to actually have a genuine audience with the Bright Queen. And so they're forced to do something else. Putting on some honestly very explicit bondage gear, they go into this entire scenario pretending to be the slaves and servants of the rest of the party. Of, of scattered parchment and scribbling with charcoal, it's kind of like a like like a, a, a nightmare tailor experience. <laughs> Before they turn up to off for a second, you see them cutting and, and bolting straps until eventually they come back with two loosely human-shaped harnesses. They'll work. They're not comfortable. And as they kind of begin putting them on you, it's uh, it's it's very unique. Yeah, breathe. There like, you go. Like uh... collar, chest harness. Yeah. Uh, you know, arms at front, cuffs. Right. Um, full thing. Do we still get the mob on those? Yeah, of course we do. BDSM up in here. <laughs> oh, oh, I'm gonna zip your mouth shut. Oh, fuck you! Yeah. <laughs> 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 Harnesses. <laughs> oh, man. Yet another scenario where Caleb doesn't have control. And that makes things even more difficult, especially with how the party chooses to treat him. Ford is honestly a huge jerk. It's not so much a punishment as it is an honor for them. <laughs> Caleb, why don't you come over here and make sure my boots are looking oh. clean for the Brat Queen, will you? I take a very filthy rag out of my pocket. <laughs> He's about to buff his shoe. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> this is awful. <laughs> Zythir so actually lets out a chuckle watching this. <laughs> well, you've sent me on how to pass the time. Mm. I've had this dream. <laughs> <laughs> As is not, and well, okay, basically the entire party. And what's important to note is Taliesin was actually not here for this episode. He was in the prior episode where Cad was killed accidentally. However, in this episode, he was sick and therefore was not able to be there. Sadly, no Talison tonight. He's very sick, so he's home, probably watching, hopefully watching this, so you can keep up with well, well, how, we, how we ruin your character while you're gone. Um, but yeah, so get better, buddy, and we'll, we'll see you when we come back. Got too close to a time-traveling version of himself. Yeah, he's like, I can make it, and we're like, no. The reason I mention this is I feel he genuinely would have been a very balancing force to the rest of the party here, but without him actually being there and Matt having to puppet him, there wasn't anything to put a limit on how badly they were mistreating Bo and Caleb. And this only led to more mistreatment to Caleb, a further lack of control. And because of the way that Liam plays his characters, he remains quiet and takes on a lot of it and genuinely just doesn't actually interact as much as you'd think and doesn't push back. He remains silent 
He takes it and he accepts his lot, but you can feel that anger and resentment brewing underneath. Oh. What if you sit down on your hands and knees and then we sit on you like you're our, oh. our personal Yeah, like, like benches. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like you, we, you come around with us and give us like, you know. You're very expensive benches that you hire. Very powerful bench. Among other things. I've yeah. always thought that about Real important job description. Wow. How did I get here with you people? <laughs> We take you to all the best places. We're about to meet a queen, yo. <laughs> this is amazing. And that is what sets us up for the true final moment of this story that becomes a genuinely unforgettable moment. So they enter the court of the Bright Queen. It's honestly really well described and Matt does a genuinely great job of really communicating the gravitas of this moment, how powerful this individual is, why she's important. You see a beautiful figure. <clears throat> a voice rings out, kind of sourceless around you. Visitors, you bear witness to the Bright Queen Layla's Queen. The woman in his throne stands in a sparkling warrior dress of crystals and mithril chain. Her beautiful dark gray-blue skin peeking from beneath the vibrant glow of glittering beads and armor plates. Her white hair topples from under a headdress of three white crystal uh, ebex-like horns that curve to the back. Past her shoulders, the hair meets her waist from behind. Her piercing turquoise eyes look down at you from above a stern smile. She steps up, lording right over where the dodecahedron is, coming no closer as you are all led to stop kind of between these three raised platforms, the bright light ahead, casting shadows directly around where your ankles and feet are. The voice once more ominous and around you say, may she warm your weariness. And while this is going on, once again, Caleb is forced to sit back. Now, anybody who's watched the campaign knows that the Mighty Nine have two people who are the face of the party. Ford, because he has the highest charisma, and Caleb, because he has the second highest charisma, and also he tends to be the most logical. However, in this scenario, Caleb is not allowed to talk because he's being treated as a slave. And Ford doesn't say anything because Travis is honestly just a great role player and knows when to take a step back. And so Jester and Not are the ones who approach the Bright Queen and try to explain everything that's happened. However, the two of them are not very charismatic. And also, they tend to be the joke characters of the campaign for the most part, which means that the two players are playing into the comedy of it in a very serious scene. So, shockingly, somehow it begins to go downhill. Uh, that's a one, so I'll use this. <laughs> Change that timeline. Way better. Still not great with my negative three. Might nine for me! Was it? Now, in order to be able to convince the Bright Queen of what's going on, they use a little bit of dunamancy from the beacon that they carry. Now, this beacon, this artifact that I mentioned earlier, is incredibly important to this dynasty, but the dynasty does not know the Mighty Nine have it. They kept it very secret because in order to reveal that they have it would be a huge thing. It would be very bad for them. And so, when they use this dunamancy, the Bright Queen notices. Okay, a couple things. <laughs> we are in silly bed. <laughs> <laughs> One, the warm expression of the Queen becomes less warm oh. and a bit more stone-faced. And specifically in the moment that you concentrate and utilize that fragment of possibility within you. There's a, there's a brief. A brief hold on. There is a, there is a brief, just a, a, a slight head turn of acknowledgement towards you and a curious look. And while there's a moment of, uh oh, are they gonna find out what's gonna happen? It only becomes more obvious when things take a turn for even more of the worse because as Not and Jester are forced to make roles to attempt to placate the queen, another member of the court speaks up. He steps forward and he informs her of exactly who this group is. A, a voice comes out from the side, the left side of you amongst the thrones, it goes, my queen, if I could speak. Yeah. Is that like the end? 
You look to your left to find the voice, and uh, Lythir is standing there. Of course. And she puts out a hand. Uh Lythir steps forward and goes, My eye has been caught by these travelers. For their smell is alien, their intent unclear. I myself still recover from wounds suffered along the western edges of the Ashkeeper Mountains, not a week before. As does my partner, a lauded Echo Knight in your service, my queen. We came upon a troop of Dwendalian scouts seeking weakness in our borders, wishing subterfuge upon our brave soldiers. We did battle and slew many of their filthy ilk, but were forced to flee when the tides turned against us. When these creatures, these allies of the Empire, assailed us. At this point, each member of the party tries their hardest to explain themselves, to lie, to tell the truth, to beg, to do anything to escape this fate. But Matt sets out a battle map, and it's made clear that they have only two choices, to fight or to give up. So as each of the party member gives up, as they accept their lack of control. What are we going to do? Fight you guys? You guys are super powerful. We don't work for the Empire. Please. The guards all. <laughs> What should we do? Even more. Like, say something. Begin to arrive up. We have to tell her the truth. Tell her, tell her the truth. And the guards begin to rush forward and just grab you at the shoulders. They grab Caleb. The one member who has no control, who has never had control in their life, finally decides it's enough. I am sorry. We are sorry. We have come to bring you something. We have come to bring you something. We have come a long way. No. No. Oh, no. Oh, no. Just get arrested, man. Just get arrested. They push Caduceus onto the ground. Um, Yasha is currently being put into shackles. Please, please spare us. He's my he's my husband. You, you have my husband. You're hold, you're holding my husband. There's no there's no attention being paid. The Empire is working against you. Wild Mount is working against you, and we have brought the proof. If you will allow me to show it to you. The uh, <laughs> Zythir across the way goes, What proof? I need to approach my friend. I need to remove something from. Make a persuasion check. Oh boy. Oh boy. This went perfectly in my head. 16. At this point, Caleb would take control. He would control his fate. He would not be under anyone's boot any longer. And as such, he would perform one of the biggest gambles possible and hope that it pays off. Anything strange and I take off your head. Chester, I am coming to you, okay? Yeah, as you reach for it, in there. You, you hear the sound of many blades being drawn as you reach for the bag. <laughs> Echoing through the immense chamber, the bright light bearing down on top of you. You can feel the sweat beads forming and dripping down your forehead and gathering in your brow. I say this as a child of the Empire. Connected to inner circles there, long ago. And I reach in and grab the dodecahedron. Okay. The minute you pull the dodecahedron out, you hear the clattering of metal. Ting, 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 ting. <gasps> Gasps. If you thought air was escaped from the room before, it is a vacuum now in silence. The thrum of the object in your hand, the light pulsing like the heartbeat since the moment you found it, every eye upon you. And the queen, the bright queen herself, Elis Kryn, has stepped around the art object, the symbol that sits before her throne, and looks down straight into her eyes wide. You see tears forming at the corners of her face. I am of the Empire, but I am no friend to the Empire. Up until this moment, Caleb was helpless. He had nothing going on for him. While he had all this power, all of this magic, he was confined by chains that were in his own mind. He had been controlled his whole life, and in this moment, he finally took his fate 
He stepped forward. He said, I have no allegiance to that empire. I have no allegiance to the people who controlled me. And he held up the artifact that would surely doom him and said, we've brought this to you. Be our ally. I want to make it very clear that this moment is honestly a little controversial because when he did this, it was clear half the table was not super into him doing this. This was an action that would change the entire campaign and not everybody was on board with it. However, the reason I think it works, the reason I think it was great is because there was no other option to take. They were going to get arrested or they could do something big. And honestly, I think Liam understood that if they got arrested, they were gonna search the bag and find the Lux and Beacon anyways. So something had to happen and he chose to step forward and take a big action. But what it represents for the character, I think is even more important because it represents the final decision to do something to take a hold of his future, to no longer be pushed along by the tide, to be pushed along by the river where he could go nowhere else, but to finally make a decision for himself and stand with allegiance. And I think that's fantastic. Even more so, I think it's interesting because Matt takes a moment here to pause. If you watch through the episode, he pauses to allow Liam to talk as if he knew Liam wanted to do something. I don't know if they were texting beforehand, it had been communicated, or maybe Liam had just raised his hand and I sort of missed it. But it's clear Matt knew something was going on and therefore the DM was backing it. And that is also an important moment when taking into account these sort of scenarios in your game. But all in all, it led to one of the most influential, powerful, and most important moments of the entire campaign that everybody talks about, but it wouldn't have been that important had we not seen the context leading up to it. Why Caleb chose to do this. Now, do I know if Liam did this because of all the previous interactions? I don't know, but I think it makes for a much more interesting story. And isn't that much more fascinating, much more fun, much more exciting? See, large gambles are not something to take lightly, but when they do happen, I think it's important that the DM backs it up, it makes sense for the characters, and it truly changes the story. In the end, it was an incredible moment because it was the first time we ever saw Caleb decide to make a decision. A decision to take control, to no longer let the Empire or his past or others control him. To seize his own destiny and take a chance. But it wouldn't be the end for him either. I can't speak for everybody, but I myself know that I tend to view the world as if it were a story. I feel it should follow story beats, plot points. And when somebody makes the right decision, that should be the end of the story. Their story should be on a new path now. But the truth is that's not how it works. You can make the right decision once, but to take a new path, you have to make the right decision again. And then after that again, and again, and again. Self-improvement takes constant work and to not become discouraged by that is difficult. And over the course of the story of Mighty Nine, we see Caleb continue to struggle with this. But he had friends and family who were there to continue to remind him how far he had come. And that, that's something beautiful and a wonderful reminder that we can all have a chance to change. But it only means something to us once we can look back and see how far we've come. So, I think it's a beautiful story that does an amazing job making sure to tell what it's like to take your fate into your own hands and to make a choice, a gamble, to move forward. I think that's pretty great. I didn't script out an outro for this one, so, you know, we'll do the typical YouTuber stuff. Do you want you to change your feet? <laughs> now, if you had the chance to change your feet, would ya? <laughs> Such a dumb way to end the video. Anyways. If you had the chance to comment, subscribe, and like. I was actually gonna say, if you wanna go down to the comments and just comment if you had the chance to change your fate, would you? And confuse everybody who didn't finish the video, that would be amazing. Um, also, like, comment, subscribe, you know, while you're down there, all that good stuff. Anyways, bye! If you had the chance to change your fate, would you?